Good morning. Welcome to our Central Cluster Reformation Day service. It is so good to be together as one church across our different congregations. You are most welcome, and we are so delighted to worship together. We are in for a special treat. We are so delighted that the uh, brand new, just elected at the end of the summer, uh, Reverend Dr. Guy Irwin, who is the new president of the United Lutheran Seminary, in Pennsylvania, as well as the Ministerium of Pennsylvania Chair and Professor of Reformation Studies, is today's preacher. Thank you, uh, Dr. Irwin. We are so glad that you agreed to do this and uh, to get to welcome the new president into our congregations. It is good to be church together on this day. We remember all things Lutheran and that the church reformed is ever reforming. Let us worship the living God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your way to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
praise for Jesus, as gift The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Gracious Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. Fill it with all truth and peace. Where it is corrupt, purify it. Where it is an error, direct it. Where in anything it is a mess, reform it. Where it is right, strengthen it. Where it is in need, provide for it where it is divided, reunite it for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the prophet Jeremiah, from the 31st chapter, beginning at the 31st verse. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to one another, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
The second reading is from the third chapter of Romans. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For no human being will be justified in his sight by deeds prescribed by the law. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. He did this to show his righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over the sins previously committed. It was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous and that he justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of boasting? It is excluded. By what law? By that of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from works prescribed by the law. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. To whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Holy Gospel according to St. John, the eighth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Then Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We are descendants of Abraham, and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you. Dear friends in the congregations of the Central Cluster of the New Jersey Synod, grace to you and peace from God our Creator and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for inviting me to be with you this morning for your joint Reformation Sunday observance. I'm very grateful for the invitation and conscious of the honor of being asked to preach on such an important day. It is truly good to be with you. You will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Every year on Reformation Sunday, we hear this text from John's Gospel, and every year these words ring out clear and true and inspiring to me. It's easy to imagine the liberation that Martin Luther found in this truth, a truth that took the fate of his troubled soul out of his own faltering hands and put it directly into the hands of God instead. How wonderful it is to hear again this morning of the power of truth to set us free. But this year, something feels different. The text rings out as forcefully as ever, but we aren't in the same place as last year or the year before. I feel as though I have woken up this year in another country, maybe even in another era, Truth, the truth that is supposed to set us free, just isn't what it used to be. 
Truth today is a concept under attack, challenged, relativized, bastardized into differing, competing claims that are truth-like without actually being true. As elusive as truth has always been, the regular and constant stream of obvious untruth that has become part of the public discourse in our land has cost us even the abstract sense that we are seeking together after a truth that we can all recognize. Now, especially if power is your object, it seems more effective to sow doubt, encourage fear, and to stoke anger among us. Even to lie seems no longer to be a shameful thing. Being caught out publicly in a lie means hardly anything in a post-shame world. The response is just to lie some more and insist, I never said that. In a post-truth, non-truth world, where is the freedom? Lost. What is there instead? Lies. Lies that enslave. Here's the corollary to Jesus' words, this world has taught me. Lies enslave us. A culture of lies is a culture of bondage and oppression, in which evil masquerades as virtue, and greed dresses up as prosperity, and misogyny and homophobia and racism are disguised as Christian faith. A culture of lies makes people think of themselves as victims, then exploits them in their victimhood and enslaves them to false fears, making them hate others for the threat they think they represent. Powerful lies capture weak minds and harden hearts. The truth will set you free. Jesus might just have well said, lies will make you slaves. Why has this not been clearer to us? We have been so hopeful all these years, especially Americans marinated in optimism and nursed on dreams of equality and opportunity. We have preferred to imagine that we are better than we actually are. We have looked on the bright side as our material wealth and personal agency and individual freedoms have grown. And we have overlooked the fear and anger felt among us by those who have heard the same promise that we have, that life would be better in every successive generation, but who have not found that promise to be true for them. Some of us may share parts of that resentment. Martin Luther actually understood this better than I think we do. Luther was far less optimistic about the world and his fellow human beings than we are. He believed that the world was in the grip of the devil, the father of lies, who twisted human hearts and minds with fear and greed. Sometimes he even fell into the trap himself, as in his own irrational fears. But Luther knew that he lived in a world full of lies, a world he saw more clearly perhaps than we can see our own. And the biggest lie of all, at least for Luther, was the claim that some human beings held the power of salvation over others. Specifically, that the church, through its penitential system and the priestly power to forgive, literally held the keys to heaven in human hands to be used for human purposes. It was a reassuring lie, but it was a lie all the same. And Luther risked his life and the wrath of those whose power lay in perpetuating and promoting the lie by challenging it and calling it by its right name and reducing its power to frighten and enslave. Most of us, raised in a 500-year-old tradition of Lutheran theology and church life, have little appreciation 
of the great effort and risk involved in Luther's challenge to what back then seemed like ancient, immutable, inherited truths enshrined in centuries of structure and practice. It took great courage for Luther to call a lie what the church called truth. It took courage to face the inevitable question, who do you think you are, you, to tell us what is true? Nobody, Luther might well have answered. I'm nobody, but it's not about me, it's about the truth. And it was, not about Luther as a person, but about a God powerful enough for Luther and for all of us to trust. The God Martin Luther found in Scripture was a loving God, a self-giving God, even a suffering God, dying on a cross. And this God was a God whose promises were true and sure. This was a liberating truth so strong that it gave Luther courage to withstand a whole world full of lies. This is a liberating truth so convincing that when Luther gave it voice, it liberated not only him, but a generation, an era, a nation, half a continent, and today, half a millennium later, this truth reaches around the globe, embracing millions, freeing people of their fear of not being good enough to be loved by God. I used to think, that the great lie of our time was that material things would make you happy, and that the way we are tempted to organize our lives around our possessions was a great lie designed to make us all captive to consumerism. I actually still believe that to some extent. But I am much more concerned today with the fresher, bolder, less inhibited lie that's being promoted right now all around us that there is no real truth except what we want to be true. I am deeply offended by this lie, and for the first time in my life it frightens me that it has my world so tightly in its grip. Because no matter what we say, there is still truth. There is still a truth, this truth, the truth that Jesus speaks to the children of Abraham, the truth of God shown in Jesus Christ. It's a hard truth to hear because to truly hear it, we have to strip away all the lies we have used to hide and comfort ourselves and we have to accept a truth we don't define and which comes from outside of us. But this is Jesus' truth that God works apart from us, outside of us, even without us, to show us that God loves us. What is more, Jesus shows this truth to us not just in his words, but in his person, in his life, and in his death. Jesus shows us a truth that is infinitely distant, yet intimately present for us in human form in a body like ours that can touch people in pain with tenderness, but which can also be tortured and killed. Jesus himself is the truth that passes all our understanding, but at the same time, a truth that can be felt on our skin in a drop of baptismal water. Jesus is the truth far too big to comprehend, but a truth that we can taste as often as we do it in a crumb of bread and a drop of wine. Jesus is the truth that is in us when we know, when we know not in the way scholars know, but like children know, that we belong to God and that nothing can separate us from God's love not fear or want or prejudice or hate. Love is the truth that overcomes the lies, the lies we tell ourselves and the lies we tell each other. 
There is no abstract truth, no rational truth so convincing it can heal our broken hearts. Only the ultimate, intimate truth of being loved. Knowing we are loved does change everything. It puts us in a new place, a place in which we can be less afraid of each other and the storm all around us. It really does free us, most of all, from our fear. This is the freedom which Jesus promises. To break down the walls our fears have built around us. Fear of not being enough, fear of failure, fear of being different, even the fear of others, of people not like us. Jesus came into our midst as a human, as one of us, came to show us that God loves us not because of who we are, but simply because we are. We are God's creation, God's image, God's children. This is what Jesus means by truth, and this is a truth that makes us truly free to know that we are loved by God. Amen.
Let us confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again and ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Let us offer our prayers now to God, responding to each petition with the words, Grant us your tender care. We pause together in a moment of silence. On this day, commemorating the Reformation, O God, we pray that Christian churches around the globe be reformed and renewed, that ecumenical collaboration be widened and deepened, and that Lutherans stand firm in the gift of the gospel. Hear us, holy God, Grant us your tender care. Attending to the natural earth, O God, we pray today that the seas and lands be cleansed of pollution, that both rainstorms and droughts be moderated, and that animals retain their habitat. Hear us, steadfast God. Grant us your tender care. Aware of disorder around the world, O oh God, we pray that wars and armed terrorism cease, that violent extremism everywhere be calmed, that governments meet the needs of their poorest residents, that the days before our own election be peaceful, and that all prejudice based on gender, color, orientation, or ethnicity be rejected. Hear us, sovereign God. Grant us your tender care. Facing the coronavirus, O oh God, we pray that the pandemic and its anxieties subside, that medical personnel and services be everywhere supported, that any who are unemployed find work, and all who have been evicted find housing. And we pray that a trustworthy vaccine be developed. Hear us, compassionate God, Grant us your tender care. Moved by the needs of all of our neighbors, O God, we pray today for those suffering from discrimination, for those who are incarcerated or held in immigrant camps, for farm workers and their children, for all who are hungry, and for those we name now before you in our hearts silently. Hear us, Mother and God. Grant us your tender care. Thinking lastly this morning, O God, of ourselves, we pray that we be enabled to love our neighbors as ourselves, and we pray now that you will receive our personal petitions. Hear us, loving God. Grant us your tender care. Grateful for the lives of all who have died in the faith, especially Martin Luther, and all the people whose efforts reformed and renewed the church, O oh God, we pray that at the end we join them in your glory. Hear us, eternal God. Grant us your tender care. Enfold in your loving arms all for whom we pray today, as we trust in your might and your mercy, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen.
Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Well now, dear siblings in Christ, this is the time in our service. After having heard the word proclaimed in so many powerful ways, from the sermon by President Guy Irwin, from uh, the readings through the music, we have heard God speaking to us. I, at least I hope you have heard God speaking to you. But now we are called to give thanks to God for God's abundant generosity in our lives. And we are called now, on this Reformation Sunday, even more so to act boldly. Act boldly on behalf of others. Act boldly in response to God's amazing generosity. So how are you being called right now to offer, to offer your gifts, your time, your talents, your resources to serve your neighbor, to do the works of justice and mercy that we are called to do? Maybe it's to continue to uh, give faithfully to your congregations, as so many of you have done, especially during this uh, time of uh, pandemic. Maybe it's, to, maybe it's to make a special gift to United Lutheran Seminary so that we can, our church can continue to raise up leaders to serve in congregations and communities. Maybe it's to make a gift to the Lutheran Disaster Response, who has already, has been working tirelessly to care for those people who have been devastated by the wildfires out west or the hurricanes down the Gulf Coast. Or maybe it's something else entirely. How is God calling you right now to act boldly, to offer your time, talents, and resources? Let us together give thanks to God. Amen. One, two, three, four.
Let us join together in the offering prayer. Let us pray. Merciful Father, we offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us, ourselves, our time, and our possessions, signs of your gracious love. Receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Receive now the benediction. For all that God can do within us, for all that God can do without us, thanks be to God. For all in whom Christ lived before us, for all in whom Christ lives beside us, thanks be to God. For all the Spirit wants to bring us, for where the Spirit wants to send us, thanks be to God. The blessing of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you on your way together now and forever. Amen. Amen.
let us go forth in peace. Christ is with you. Thanks be to God. <laughs>